All right, welcome back. Today is part two of our BCBA exam review series, where I'm going through a full BCBA exam, question by question, and breaking down each question, how I think you should think about it when you're taking your BCBA exam. If you're new to the channel, welcome. If you're returning, welcome back. I hope these are helpful. As always, remember the best way to get good at ABA and good at taking the BCBA exam is applying our concepts to real life scenarios. As you go throughout your day, be sure to apply these concepts as much as you can to actual scenarios in your life. The more you do this, the better you will get at the exam. So keep working hard, keep studying hard. As usual, any questions or comments, email me or leave them below, happy to help. Other than that, let's get right into our questions. Number 11, John knows if he wants to stay out on Saturday night, he needs to ask his mom. If he asks his dad, his dad will just say no. Mom functions as a what? Pretty common scenario. Uh, one parent is the parent you go to when you need something. The other parent is not, right? So you've learned to discriminate <clears throat> based on history of reinforcement. So dad saying no, is not giving reinforcement to the request to stay out on a Saturday night. However, mom will provide that reinforcement. So what has mom conditioned herself to be? Is mom a discriminative stimulus for reinforcement? Yes, right? What does the SD do? The discriminative stimulus or the SD signals reinforcements available. So if you see mom and you need to have permission to stay out, you know mom signals that reinforcements available for the request. So what do you do? You ask mom, can I stay out? She says yes, and you stay out. So mom is functioning as a discriminative stimulus for reinforcement. When you're taking your BCBA exam, even if you're sure of the answer, make sure you read all your answer choices. We're looking for the best answer. Discriminative stimulus for punishment. Obviously mom is not signaling punishment, right? P reinforcement is available through mom and not punishment. Mom is not an establishing operation. The motivation is already there to ask to stay out. And then of course, an abolishing operation reduces motivation, which is not occurring, okay? Mom is simply signaling reinforcement is available for the request to stay out on a Saturday night. During RBT training, Linda shows the trainees a video of a client working on a worksheet. She asks the trainees to record the number of times the client goes off task, which is defined as doing something other than working on the worksheet for more than 10 seconds straight. Trainee one records four times, trainee two records three times, and trainee three records two times. The trainee's measurement lacks what? Okay, on the BCBA exam, some of the questions can be lengthy. They can be full of information, okay? What you're looking for when you're reading the questions are those two or three phrases or words or sentences that are gonna clue you in to what the answer is. And that starts with understanding what the question is asking, okay? It's not really important about the worksheet and the off task and everything else. We're looking for what our measurement lacks, okay? And based on our measurement, all three trainees recorded different times. So what are we lacking here? Are we lacking accuracy? Well, we don't know, right? We don't know what the actual number of times the, the, train, the off task behavior occurred. Remember, accuracy is just simply measuring exactly what occurred. There's no information telling us if we're accurate or not. Okay, so A is out. B, validity. Validity is measuring the actual behavior that is occurring. And for all intents and purposes, it seems like they're actually measuring the off task behavior. Okay, they're just not getting the same numbers. Okay. So it seems like it's valid, right? We just, we're not matching up on our measurement. So what about reliability? Well, we only get one measurement from each trainee. So it's hard to say if we were to repeat this again and again, would we get reliable data? That leaves us with IOA or inter-observer agreement, which is simply two or more people measuring the same thing and seeing if that data matches, right? In this case, it doesn't, okay? We lack inter-observer agreement. We've got three different obser observees recording three different types of data, okay? And that lacks IOA. You need IOA with data, okay, to ensure 
your data is all the above, right? Accurate, valid, and reliable, okay? And we're lacking IOA across our trainee measurements. 13, Billy is frequently late to his job by 10 to 15 minutes. His boss met with him and informed him he needed to start showing up on time or he might lose his job. Billy typically lays in bed for 20 to 30 minutes on his phone after his alarm goes off. It takes him 10 minutes to get dressed. His coffee pot is automatic and he typically eats toast in the car. If Billy wanted to get to work on time, what behavior would make would it make the most sense to address first? Okay, so when we're going in and assessing behaviors, okay, we can't fix everything, right? So we want to look at for behaviors that are going to have the most impact, okay, that are socially valid, right? And usually the ones that make the most sense, right? We got we have to think um, parsimoniously, simply, okay? So what's the quickest way to get Billy to his job on time? That's what we're looking for here, okay? A, Billy should skip breakfast, which will give him a few extra minutes in the morning. Well, Billy eats toast in the car. He typically eats his breakfast in the car, right? So he's already on the way to work by the time he's eating breakfast, okay? That's not going to be have a whole lot of impact on being late to his job by 10 or 15 minutes. Billy should reduce the duration it takes to get dressed. What well, only takes him 10 minutes to get dressed, okay? It's, it's going to be difficult to get that any quicker, okay? Um, we could try, but even if we increased it by five minutes, right, we still would be late based on his average time to the job, okay? We can't reduce it the whole 10 minutes. He has to get dressed, okay? So that 10 minutes doesn't seem like it's going to make a difference when he's already late by 10 to 15 minutes. Billy should reduce the latency between his alarm going off and getting out of bed. So when Billy's alarm goes off, he lays in bed for 20 to 30 minutes. If we cut that in half and we increased or decreased the latency, okay, by half, that would buy us 15, 10, 15 minutes, right? This would be a great place to start to give Billy more time in the morning to get to his job on time, okay? It's going to have the most impact based on all his morning routine. And then Billy should skip coffee in the morning. Well, the coffee pot is automatic, right? So it takes him virtually no time to pour coffee and get that coffee going, okay? So the, the behavior that's going to have the most immediate impact and the highest impact is reducing the latency between his alarm going off and Billy getting out of bed. You're designing an intervention that will examine the impact of PEX training across three different set of parents. You're worried about the time it might take to collect baseline data, but you're not expecting baseline data to change since parents have not been exposed to PEX previously. What type of experimental design would fit best in this scenario? Okay, so the first part of this question immediately gives away part of the answer, right? We want an intervention across three different sets of parents. What experimental design tracks across settings, people, and behavior? Well, multiple baseline or multiple probe, right? So we know we're going to use a multiple baseline or a multiple probe, okay? So we can get these baseline and intervention data across these different sets of parents. But you're worried about the time it might take to collect baseline data. If you have to be in baseline, right, for 15, 20 sessions with these parents, okay, that's very time consuming. You don't want them to drop out, right? You don't want anything to happen, okay? So you want to reduce the amount of time and the amount of instances of baseline data. And if you don't expect baseline data to change, what can you do instead? Well, you can probe baseline, right? Instead of taking 15 consecutive sessions of baseline, you just do a probe, maybe every four days, every five days. You've effectively reduced your baseline by 60, 70%. You saved yourself time, okay? And you've reduced the chances of any sort of um, dropout, right, from the parents. So what type of experimental design would fit best in the scenario? We're looking for a multiple probe, okay? It's just like a multiple baseline where we're going across people setting their behaviors, but instead of taking a steady baseline, we're just probing our baseline, okay, every now and then until it's time to implement the intervention. When you're doing experimental design questions, okay, make sure you're really understanding what you're trying to achieve, okay? They're going to combine experimental designs on the exam, okay? They're going to ask you what one you would use, and they're going to give you little details here and there that are, that are going to tip you off on, on what type of design you should be leading towards.
Okay, so use the hints they give you in the question. Cindy teaches a gifted and talented class. She wants your class to learn teamwork. She decides she wants to implement a group contingency for homework assignments. Although her class is smart, they can also engage in instances of bullying other students. What group contingency should Cindy most likely avoid? Okay, again, a good example of the question driving you towards the answer choice, okay? You know, if we're looking at a group contingency, uh, but most of this information, it's, it's kind of unclear what we would want, right? You know, a gifted and talented class, the kids are probably pretty smart, pretty on top of things, okay? So maybe they all, all group contingencies might be effective, but what in this question is, is pushing us away from one type, okay? It's the instances of bullying, okay? What group contingency ethically is a concern from a standpoint of potential social backlash, okay? Is it the independent group contingency? Well, not necessarily because independently, independent group contingencies, each person is responsible for completing their work and when they complete their work, they're reinforced. Interdependent group contingency, the whole class is responsible, right? So everybody has to do the work. Dependent group contingency, what is another name for dependent group contingency? The hero, right? The hero group contingency, okay? This is when one or a few people are dependent. The whole group is dependent on these individuals. This can lead to bullying if that one person doesn't come through, okay? So if we are already aware of bullying, we might want to avoid this idea of a hero, right? Because that hero can turn to the villain if they don't successfully earn reinforcement. And of course, natural group contingency, Okay, it would be more natural, but we're just clearly trying to contrive a contingency here, okay? So again, another example of a question guiding you towards what you're looking for, okay? Remember your task list, remember your basics. 16, during his most recent supervision meeting, Greg, a BCBA, learned that his client is now an antidepressant after making suicidal remarks. In response, Greg designs a plan that involves talk therapy and CBT. What dimension of ABA did Greg violate? All right, so what has Greg done wrong here? Okay, we, we know our, our, our client is on antidepressants now, on medication. We want to alter her behavior, okay? But remember, what do we need to do as BCBAs, as a behavior analyst? We need to work within our scope. We need to work um, and adhere to behavior principles. By, walk, by working in talk therapy and CBT, we're, we're encroaching on private events. We're encroaching on mentalisms, on constructs, okay? So what are we violating here? Is Greg violating the dimension of conceptually systematic? Yes, right? Conceptually systematic is the dimension that says interventions and treatments should be explained and designed according to behavior analytic principles, right? We need to adhere to ABA principles. Talk therapy and CBT are outside of that scope. Greg has violated this conceptually systematic dimension. 17, this type of behaviorism does not include private events. Okay, pretty easy, straightforward question. Um, not every question on the BCBA exam is going to be the hardest question in the world. Okay, sometimes they just wanna know if you know a basic. Uh, and this type of question to me is going to be pretty common where they're just looking, you know, can you distinguish between the different types of behaviorism, the difference trying to difference is between the different behavior analytic services. Okay. And this, they simply want to know what behaviorism didn't include private events, right? Is it methodological behaviorism or radical? Well, this one's very easy. It's clearly methodological, right? Not until radical behaviorism came around when we started acknowledging private events as behavior, which doesn't necessarily mean we work on them, right? Because we can't observe and measure private events, but we, we acknowledge them as having every characteristic and abiding by the same principles of ABA, right? So methodological, ignored private events, radical came along, right? We have verbal behavior and then we have private events. So the type of behaviorism that does not include private events is methodological behaviorism. Your best friend is getting married this Saturday. On the wedding invite, the date, time, and location are listed. Additionally, there's a spot to select what food choice you want. The choices are either fish or chicken. 
What type of preference assessment best represents this scenario? Okay, remember our quick, simple rules for preference assessments. If we have one stimulus, we're looking at a single stimulus, obviously. Paired or forced choice uh, stimulus, we have two stimulus, stimuli. And then multiple stimulus with and without replacement are working with three or more stimuli. In this case, you're choosing fish or chicken. So if I were to walk up to you and say, pick fish or chicken, what am I doing? It's a forced choice, it's a paired stimulus type of preference assessment you are using or your friend is using is a paired stimulus preference assessment. Stimulus equivalence is best assessed using what? Remember, what is our stimulus equivalence? That is our symmetry, our reflexivity, and our transitivity, right? Our deductions, okay? Behavior is learned by understanding that A equals A, you know, B equals A, and when B equals C, then therefore A equals C, okay? How do we assess stimulus equivalence? Do we assess it through shaping? No, shaping is just approximations of behaviors, right? Reinforcing these to get to one terminal behavior. We're not assessing any sort of transitive property there. Expressive instructions. No, expressive instructions is, is giving instructions, right? You're delivering instructions expressively. Matching to sample. Yes, how would we assess that? Well, if I wanted to assess reflexivity, I would give you a picture of a fire truck and you would match that fire truck to the same picture of a fire truck, okay? And then I would teach you that picture equals the word fire truck. And then we would get to the point where you would identify the word fire truck and the picture as a real fire truck. So if you can match to sample the word to the picture, the picture to a real fire truck, we can assess stimulus equivalence. And obviously maintenance targets, okay, would come much later after this is already learned. If we're assessing stimulus equivalence and what part we're at or where we're at with stimulus equivalence, we would use matching to sample. You're a new behavior analyst working at a residency for adults. Four adults who hold jobs live in the residency. During a conversation with one of the residents, they tell you they smoke. You decide that you will design a behavior plan to reduce smoking since it isn't healthy. The residents tell you that they don't want to quit smoking. As the behavior analyst, what should you do? Okay, so this can be tricky, right? When you're working with adults, right, and even clients who are not of age, right, of the age of consent, we need to respect them. We need to treat their wishes with, uh, with seriousness, okay? They have a right to be involved in their treatment planning. And once they get to adulthood, okay, they have the rights of adults, right? These adults hold jobs, they live in a home, okay? If they wanna smoke, they're legally allowed to smoke, okay? So even though you feel that it's unhealthy, okay, and you feel like they should quit, they don't want to. So what are you gonna do? A, look out for the best interest of your client and design the plan to decrease smoking. Not real, no, right? Because that's, that's, that's undignifying, Okay, you're, you're going against their wishes. They don't want to quit smoking, okay? So they're not little kids, right? They're adults. We have to respect their rights that they have just like all of us, okay? So they told you, I don't want to quit. You shouldn't force your plan onto them. B, start punishing your client when you see them smoking. That's highly unethical, right? Uh, we would never jump to punishment in the first place and especially punishing something that they don't necessarily want to decrease. Okay, so B would definitely not be the answer. C, report the client to the owner of the residency. No need for that. Your client's not doing anything wrong, right? Smoking is illegal for adults. They can do it all they want. You shouldn't report them to the owner of the residency. Again, that is not respecting their rights. That is not dignifying. That leaves us with D, respect your client's request and move to different behaviors. Yes. Now, obviously you can do continuing education. You can continue to discuss these, this prospect of quitting smoking with them, but until they commit, until they're ready, we should not be forcing what we believe are our ideals onto our clients, okay? Especially adults. Okay, so that's 10 more questions. Next Friday, we'll be back with another 10. Be sure to check out our BCBA task list study guide. Part one is out. Part two will be coming soon. Okay. We have that task list study guide for sale. All right. So check that out. Questions, comments, please leave them below. Happy to help.
other than that, keep studying hard and I'll see you soon.